So when I say patients, think of um, anyone that you might be interacting with in terms of direct service. So if you're going into education, your students, clinical service, obviously your patients, social work, your clients. So really anyone that might be struggling with access to healthy food, how would you identify them and connect them to resources? And then lastly, what resources are available for folks that are struggling to access healthy food? All right, so before we begin and dive into the stats, facts, and figures, I really want to kind of see what your baseline knowledge is around food insecurity and hunger. So we have five statements up on the projector. And in your table groups, what I want you to do is look at those five statements and amongst yourselves decide if it's a fact or a myth around food insecurity. I'm going to give you three or four minutes. OK, so now that you've had a few minutes to discuss amongst your table groups what you think is a fact or what you think is a myth, um, I want to see what you, what you think. So if you think, I'm going to read a statement. If you think it's a fact, I want you to raise your hand. And if you think it's a myth, keep your hand down. Ready? Food insecurity only happens in developing nations, so like third world countries or developing countries. Is that a fact or a myth? Do you think if it's a fact, raise your hand. OK. Maine has the lowest rate of food insecurity in the United States. Anyone think that's true? OK. Everyone that needs it can receive SNAP or food stamps benefits. All right. Folks that do receive SNAP or food stamps benefits get enough to eat healthy meals all month long. All right. Obesity and type 2 diabetes are two consequences of food insecurity. OK. So I'm not going to actually tell you the answers right now. We're going to come back to these at the end. Um, but I want you to think about these throughout the presentation, because we will hit on all of these topics. So before we dive into kind of the numbers of food insecurity and what it looks like, I always like to bring up this video. It was done by the Portland Press Herald last year. And it's um, interviewing two families that are struggling with food insecurity right here in Maine. I think it's really important in conversations like this to make sure that you recognize that there is a face behind all the numbers and that food insecurity does not discriminate. Um, and really, most folks are one emergency away from being in a situation where they might not be able to afford groceries this week. All right, so those are just two examples of what food insecurity can look like in the state of Maine. And unfortunately, they're two really common examples. Um, we're going to go into in a few minutes who's affected by food insecurity in the state of Maine, but I always like to do a quick refresher on what is food insecurity. So you'll often hear the term food insecurity and hunger used interchangeably. But those are actually two different things. So food insecurity is really about the limited or uncertain availability of healthy food, or the limited or uncertain ability to acquire culturally appropriate food. And hunger is really the physiological symptom of food insecurity. So it's your body's reaction to not having enough calories to eat to function properly. And then under all of that is really um, nutrition insecurity and malnutrition. So when people use hunger um, and food insecurity interchangeably, they're actually talking about two separate things. There are three core components of food, in, food security, utilization, availability, and access. So utilization, meaning the appropriate use of food and the appropriate amount of food and the appropriate kind of food that, for your family. Availability and consistent and sufficient quantities of food. And sufficient access and sufficient resources to access food. And the core component around all of these is really stability. So um, we talk about food insecurity around the, about the anxiety of not knowing where your next meal is coming from or how you're going to feed your family. And in order to be food secure, it's really about the stability of all three of these components. Food insecurity in the state of Maine is a big issue. It affects just under 200,000 Mainers. 
That includes one in five children, so a little over 20% of the children in the state of Maine don't know where their next meal is coming from. It includes one in three seniors. Maine is the oldest state in the United States, and it's only getting worse. We have the ninth highest rate of food insecurity in the country, which is really astonishing when you think of the top 10 are all in the Deep South. We have the highest rate of food insecurity in New England and the highest rate in the Northeast. We also have the highest rate of child food insecurity in the Northeast. And we have the sixth highest rate for a measure called very low food security, which is a USDA measure that measures chronic persistent hunger. So on top of having the highest rate of food insecurity in New England, we also have the highest rate of type 2 diabetes and obesity, which we'll see later really coincides with a lot of the issues around lack of access to healthy food. The state of Maine has a meal gap of 35 million meals. If you're not familiar with the term meal gap, it's a term used by Feeding America. And what it is, it's a measure of how many meals are missing from Maine tables every year. They calculate it by looking at the USDA data around food insecurity and the average cost of a meal in each state. Last year, they calculated that Maine had 35 million missing meals. So why are people food insecure? It's really important to understand that, especially in the United States, food insecurity is not about our inability to produce enough food. It's about lack of access for the people that are food insecure. In Maine in particular, we have really high rates of underemployment, which basically means that although people are employed, they're not making enough money to make ends meet. They're having to piece together two, sometimes three part-time jobs making minimum wage. We also have a really high cost of living. So we have really high inelastic expenses, such as housing, utilities, transportation, fuel, that families really can't skimp down on when they're trying to tighten their belts, which really means that when uh, budgets are tight, food is the only thing people can cut from their budgets. This is a graphic from the Maine Center for Economic Policy, and what they did was really looked at the amount of Maine families that are working at least part-time or full-time, but still living really at or just above the poverty level. And what they found was one in three families live at or near poverty, although they're working. Since 2001, Maine's lost about 37,000 middle-class jobs, and although our employment rate is pretty steady, What's happened is a lot of those jobs have been replaced with low paying jobs in retail, food service, and hospitality. So folks went from making a decent living wage to really skimping by on minimum wage. Between 2012 and 2015, approximately 31% of the growth in income in the, in the state of Maine went to the top 5% of earners. The, top, the lowest 25% of earners in the state of Maine only saw income growth of about 0.2%. So although income growth is happening, it's not being uh, spread out evenly among um, folks in the state. Another important factor is the economy in the state of Maine. So since 2008 in the recession, the state of Maine in our economy has actually shrunk by about 1%. Compared to the to the overall United States, which has grown about 13%, in New England, which has grown about 8%. So not only are folks struggling to piece together part-time jobs, the economy is shrinking. We've kind of gone over the most common barrier to accessing healthy food finances, right? But there are some other factors that might hinder someone's ability to access healthy food such as money, transportation, and time. So transportation, when we think about that in the state of Maine, we are a very large rural state. And we think of transportation to the grocery store, from the grocery store, to work, back, work, back to work, um, and fuel in terms of putting gas in the car. And we're going to go into that in a second. But one thing that we don't often talk about is time scarcity or time poverty. So 
Folks that are piecing together multiple part-time jobs, often with unpredictable schedules, are trying to balance childcare or care for someone else in their family with their full-time job, often have what's called time poverty. So they don't have time to sit down with their family and think about what nutritious food they can make tonight. They're really depending on fast, convenient food, which we'll see later can hinder their health. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term food deserts, um, but a food desert is really a community where a grocery store or a well-stocked um, grocery store is not within a reasonable walking distance. In the state of Maine, we have 22 communities that are considered food deserts. This is a map of food deserts in the United States. In most communities, food deserts are measured by how far away a grocery store is in terms of if a grocery store is more than one mile and there's no public transportation, the community is considered a food desert. In the state of Maine, that measure is a little bit different because we know that really only a few of our metropolitan areas have access to public transportation. So for the state of Maine, food deserts are measured by uh, I think five miles from a grocery store in, and inadequate access to a car or other transportation. Like I said, there are 22 food deserts in the state of Maine. They are mainly in the Rim counties, so Aroostook, Washington, Upper Somerset. And these are the communities that really lack access to healthy, nutritious food on a regular basis. So in these communities, even if you have money, and you, are, and you have money to get nutritious food and buy it, and you are making a good income, you still might not be able to access healthy food. Another tragedy in these communities is because of the way that the global food system works, a lot of these communities are really at the end of the line in terms of distribution of healthy food. So if you think about where most of our fresh produce comes from, especially this time of year, it's California, Texas, Arizona, all of that food has to be shipped up to Maine, shipped up to Aroostook County, shipped up to Washington County. So by the time it gets there, it's usually already lost most of its shelf life. And then the added transportation cost to get it up there actually makes it more expensive than it is in Southern Maine or in Southern New England. So not only are these folks struggling to access healthy, nutritious food, it's also more expensive for them to get it. So who is food insecure in the state of Maine? About 35% of households that utilize the emergency food network contain children. 40% of households contain seniors. 50% of households contain someone with a disability. Overall, about 87% of households that utilize our emergency food network, meaning the food pantry or soup kitchen network, have someone with, have a child, a senior citizen, or someone uh, living with disabilities in their household. So before I keep giving you all of this information, I want you to think about how food insecurity might present in your future careers. So again, I know you aren't all going into clinical fields. So when I, mean, when I say patient, I mean anyone that you're working through direct service with. So at your tables, I want you to discuss these three questions. What are some ways food insecurity may present themselves in your patients? So what are some symptoms or some ways that you would know that someone is struggling with access to healthy food? How might, food in, how might you address food insecurity in your future practice? And what resources do you know of that you can connect folks to? I'll have you talk for about five minutes and then we can share back out. Okay, I can hear you guys kind of wrapping up your conversations. So I'm not gonna put anyone on the spot, but does anyone have any idea how food insecurity might present itself, so what are some common signs that someone might be struggling to access healthy food? No one has any idea what food insecurity may look like? Okay. What about um, some resources? What resources do you know about that you can connect folks to? Food pantries? Is there anything else? Is it just food pantries? Um, sorry, it's um, I'm School of Social Work. Um, my name is Libby. And we're working on a case study in a small group in one of my classes right now. And it's um, a woman who is 
um, a mother and uh, immigrant from Mexico, and she and her husband have six children and or four children, something like that. And um, he's a hard worker and he's a construction worker, but he's just not able to meet ends meet. And so that's really part of her feeding into her depression and anxiety. And there's some um, cultural factors that have come into play. And um, he, uh, the husband is very proud and um, doesn't want to reach out to the government for help. Um, and some of that may also be raising a red flag that their nephew who's living with them is an undocumented immigrant. So that was one of the barriers to food for that family. She temporarily right now is reaching out to the church and they're helping her, but it doesn't seem to be sustainable. So we're working on a plan for her. Yeah, absolutely. Anxiety, depression, um, stress around where your next meal is coming from, how you're going to access that is a major factor in terms of food insecurity. Does anyone else have any ideas around resources you could connect folks to? Hi, Neva, uh, pharmacy program. I know I live in downtown and there's a, um, there's a church that I see out on their sign and there's a couple of them that are constantly having like food, free food, like certain days of the week or they have like pantries and they, they post them out on their signs, like the days that you can come and just get food. Like, and it's, it's for anyone, it's not just you know, you know, people who are struggling, it's like literally if, if you cannot put food on your plate, you can just go. Yeah, absolutely. The food pantries are often held at places of worship, so. Hi, I'm a dental student and um, I actually love to garden and so I'm a part of a community garden here in town and the garden itself has, um, we have a huge, um, cooler that any of the extra food that we produce in our gardens goes straight to um it's free for people so i think that the portland community garden has their own little like pantry but that's like super fresh food you know it's most of it is lettuce and radishes and that kind of stuff so another resource um, i know that the portland boys and girls club they provide free um dinners for a lot of the kiddos there and I know I think sometimes they try to pack um, breakfast for kids as well um, and try to give them to families in need. Awesome. All right so we're going to go into you know how do you identify folks that are struggling to access healthy food and what resources can you connect them with. Um, there are really two main type of resources that we'll go over but there's a lot of other more local initiatives as well that we can talk about. So in terms of food insecurity and its impact on your health, um, it's been linked to a lot of different um, health outcomes for infants and children, as well as children, adults, and teens. For infants and children, um, low birth weight is a really common indicator of uh, malnutrition or food insecurity in the mother, as well as issues around cognitive delays, asthma, um, anemia due to iron deficiency, Kids that are food insecure are more likely to experience common colds, more likely to be sick, more likely to spend time out of class. That's actually been linked to educational delays in children. Because if you think about how do you feel when you're anxious about food or you're hungry? If you're like me, you get hangry, right? So what happens to kids that are acting out in class over frustration because they're hangry or they're anxious about not having food this weekend and it's a Friday afternoon. They get sent out of class, so they're more likely to be sent out of class to the principal's office, to the guidance counselor, to the school nurse with a stomach ache. Um, and then all the time that they're spending out of class means that they're more likely to have to repeat a grade in school in the long run. So there's a lot of um, educational um, impacts that food insecurity can have on a child. For teens, uh, food insecurity presents itself in terms of mental distress. So teens are four times more likely to have depressive episodes if they're food insecure. They're five, they're five likely to have committed to attempt suicide. 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 Um, and they're more likely to utilize mental health services, educate, um, counseling, and behavioral health services. 
In adults, there's been a lot of research recently around the connection between food insecurity and the prevalence of chronic illnesses. So um, they've actually done some studies around food insecurity and your probability of developing chronic illnesses such as asthma, COPD, um, some types of cancer even, kidney disease, and then of course things like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes. Um, adults that are food insecure are more likely to be in poor health. Um, they're more likely to have pregnancy complications, and they're at higher risk of stroke. For older adults, um, much of the same, um, but also um, physical limitations as well as osteoporosis, um, gum disease even has been linked to food insecurity, um, congestive heart failure, as well as obesity, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. This is a graphic from a 2016 study that the USDA did looking at your probability of developing up to 11 chronic, at least one of 11 chronic health conditions as it relates to your food security status. And what they found is the more food insecure you were, the higher probability you are at of developing at least one of these chronic illnesses. So cardiovascular disease, hypertension, COPD, kidney disease, uh, type 2 diabetes, depression, anxiety, mental distress, um, as well as some, type of, some types of cor colorectal cancers. Overall, about one in three uh, adults that are managing a chronic illness cannot afford their medicine or food at all times. What, recognize when we talk about food insecurity and its connection to chronic illness, it's not that food insecurity in of itself um, makes you more at risk of chronic illness. It's really the coping mechanisms that most food insecure individuals have to adapt in order to have enough food at the table that puts them at greater risk of developing um, these um, diseases. So coping mechanisms are, um, common coping mechanisms for folks that are food insecure include swapping out Nutritious, nutritionally dense food, often more expensive food, for food that you can get really cheap and prepare really quickly, which we all know is usually full of salt, sugar, and processed carbohydrates, which in the long run can impact your ability to manage your health. Um, purchasing you know, low-cost, nutrient-poor foods, making trade-offs between food and medicine. So if your doctor is saying you need to eat a specific diet, or if you need to, you need to, you need to take your medication with uh, a, one meal, um, and you have to take it two times a day, but you can have only afford one meal a day, so not taking your medication as prescribed. Um, adults foregoing food um, so children can have it, that's really common in food insecure households with children. Cost-related medication under usage, so trying to uh, spread out your medication if it's really expensive to pick up at your doctor's office or at the pharmacy. Postponement of medical care, so not having enough money to pay your doctor's copay. Um, and then foregoing foods needed for special diets. So all of these types of coping mechanisms really put you at risk for developing a chronic illness. And then once you have developed that chronic illness, we know that managing it when you're food insecure can be a challenge. So managing a chronic illness puts you, puts more stress on your household budget and it can affect your employability. So if you don't have paid sick time or time to take off of work, and you're missing a lot of work because you're really sick and you're in the hospital or you're visiting your doctor's office frequently, that means that you might be cut from your job, which puts further strain on your household budget and then just feeds into that cycle of food insecurity. Food insecurity doesn't only affect people that are struggling to access healthy food, it really affects anyone that's utilizing healthcare services. So they've actually done some studies around the true cost of food insecurity um, on the healthcare industry. And what they found was food insecure individuals cost the healthcare industry on an average $1,800 more per person per year in healthcare cost. And mainly that's because they utilize healthcare services more often they have more hospital readmissions. They're more likely to be admitted to the hospital, which is really common with, um, we see type two diabetes patients at the end of the month when SNAP benefits typically run out, they have to go to the hospital because of low blood sugars. And then they're released after a few days and then they're back in the hospital again for a few days because they still don't have access to food. Um, 
So, um, as well as a higher rate of high cost user status, which basically just means folks that are over utilizing the healthcare system. In 2015, the American Academy of Pediatrics came out with a policy statement looking at addressing food insecurity with pediatric patients. And it's actually been adopted by the ARP as well as um, the American Hospital Association for Internal Medicine, so adults as well. Um, but really looking at what's called social determinants of health, which is a term you might or might not be aware of. Um, and it's really looking at external factors that can affect your health. So housing, food, employment, um, ability to access healthcare services. So there have been a number of studies looking at the effectiveness of screening for food insecurity in clinical settings, and then making sure that your patients are connected to resources so they don't end up back, up, back in the hospital or that they don't end up having to uh, go to the doctor's office more frequently because they're getting more sick frequently because they don't have access to healthy food. So the two questions that the American Academy of Pediatrics has endorsed um, are called the hunger vital signs. There are two screening questions for food insecurity that were created in 2010 by Children's Health Watch in Boston. And they simply ask, within the past 12 months, we worried whether our food would run out before we had money to buy more. And within the past 12 months, the food we bought just didn't last and we didn't have money to get more. And it's on a scale of often, sometimes, never, or a patient can opt out, of course. And it, if a patient answers sometimes or often for either of those questions, they should be marked as food insecure and connected to ending hunger resources. So an important part of these two questions is it really gets at the financial aspect of food insecurity, so we can't afford to buy food. But also the anxiety and the stress that goes into not knowing if you're going to be able to put food on the table that night for your family. An important part of when you're talking to patients or students around food insecurity is making sure that you know what resources are available to them and educating yourself on what resources you can connect them with. And there are a number of resources, both at the federal level, at the state level, and locally, um, that we'll briefly go over. Um, but things like SNAP or food stamps, the WIC program, uh, Feeding America Network of Food Banks and Food Pantries, Meals on Wheels for Seniors, the Commodity Supplemental Food Program, which is also for seniors. Um, so we'll just kind of review really quickly the two different buckets that food resources fall into in terms of charitable assistance and the federal assistance programs. Sorry. So the federal assistance programs include things like SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, often known as food stamps, as well as programs like the temporary assistance program for needy families, uh, the commodity supplemental food program, which is for low-income seniors, Meals on Wheels, the school nutrition programs, um, so school breakfast, lunch, and summer meals, the WIC program, which is for uh, prenatal women and children up to age five, as well as uh, meals for folks that are living in uh, resident homes. An important thing to remember about these programs is that they are run at the federal level. They're almost all run either under the USDA and then run at the state level under DHHS, the Department of Ag, or the Department of Ed. So they do not reach everyone in need. I want to briefly go into SNAP because it is the most utilized program and it really is our best defense against hunger. The SNAP program was started in the 1960s and it was disseminated nationwide in 1974. And how it works is folks that are income eligible receive a debit card and every month that debit card is filled with funds that they can use to buy groceries. Important thing to remember is that they can only buy groceries with these with this food. So they cannot buy any toiletries, so toilet paper, diapers, shampoo, soap, you cannot buy with SNAP. You can't buy any hot meals, so if you're homeless and you don't have the ability to prepare food in a kitchen, you can't buy things at a salad bar or at a hot bar like at Hannaford at the soup with soup or anything like that. So 
That's an important distinguisher between SNAP. It's also income dependent. In 2014, we had about 200,000 Mainers on the SNAP program. Today, we have about 180,000, so the roles have definitely gone down. Unfortunately, that's not really because food insecurity has gotten significantly better. Um, it's largely in part, to, um, largely in part um, because of state and state regulations around asset testing, um, how long you can access the program, um, work requirements and stuff like that. In the state of Maine, about 62% of households on SNAP have children. 46% of Mainers on SNAP are older Mainers or have households with someone with a disability. 42% are working families. The average SNAP benefit is $1.19 per meal per person. So think about what kind of meal you can make for yourself with $1.19. That's why the SNAP benefit program, usually funds run out between one day and two weeks into the month. So it's really that folks just are not getting enough benefits through this program. And then there's a whole subset of folks that can't even access the program because it is um, an income eligible program. There's about 35% of Mainers that are food insecure that cannot access the program because they lay, make rate right above the poverty line in terms of um, income requirements. Nationally, about 25% of food insecure individuals don't qualify for any federal assistance program, so it's about 10% higher in the state of Maine. That's kind of where the Charitable Food Network comes in. So the Charitable Food Network is largely made up of food banks and food pantries and soup kitchens and meal sites. Feeding America is the largest hunger relief organization in the country, and it's a network of over 200 food banks. Good Shepherd Food Bank is the Feeding America affiliate in the state of Maine. And their role is essentially to help with research, evaluation, advocacy and capacity support for local food banks at the state level. Last year, their food bank served about 46 million people. Locally in the state of Maine, Good Shepherd Food Bank is your food bank of the state. We do serve, um, we like to say from Kittery to Fort Kent. And we do that by partnering with over 400 community agencies. So our community partners include traditional partners such as the food pantries, soup kitchens, and meal sites, but also include access points such as schools, healthcare providers, senior centers, after school centers. In the summer, we do summer meals in the park. So really, wherever we can increase access to food in the state of Maine, we're trying to partner with them. Last year, we provided through our network of partners 25 million meals. We serve about 178,000 Mainers annually. And then of course there's a number of local programs and this is not, the, this is not a comprehensive list by far, but I did want to call out a few really innovative ones. So the Maine Harvest Bucks program, which is a really innovative program that lets SNAP users double their SNAP dollars at local farmers markets and local food co-ops. So if you have a SNAP card and you go to a local farmers market that's participating in this program and you buy produce, you can get a voucher for however much you spent to buy additional produce at that farmers market. So it's a way to make sure that folks that are utilizing those SNAP dollars can really stretch them and have access to healthy local produce. SNAP Ed, Cooperative Extension Cooking Matters programs. Um, I don't know if you are all familiar, but SNAP Ed is actually run out of UNE here. Um, and they're really dedicated to making sure that folks that are living in the crisis of poverty and living in food insecure households are comfortable preparing food, knowing how to cook healthy food, and knowing how to shop for healthy food on a budget. There's gleaning initiatives. So gleaning is essentially when a farmer decides that they're not going to pick up the rest of their crop in the field, either because it's not worth their labor or their time. 
Um, so what happens is there's gleaning initiatives, which are groups of volunteers that go and work with those farmers and pick up that food that's left in the field and donate it to uh, things like food pantries or meal sites. And then food security councils. So these are groups across the state of Maine that are really looking at ending hunger and the food system holistically and how do we engage local ag and how do we support local farmers as well as making sure that people in the state of Maine that are having trouble accessing food can access healthy food in a way that's appropriate for them. All right, we're gonna go back to these facts and myths. You guys did a pretty good job, but um, all right, so food insecurity only occurs in developing nations. Is, is that a true, is that a fact or a myth? It's a myth, yeah. So 41 million individuals in the United States uh, suffer from food insecurity in the state of Maine. It's about 200,000. We are the, Maine has the lowest rate of food insecurity in the United States. Is that a fact or a myth? It's a myth. So Maine has the, actually the ninth highest rate of food insecurity in the United States and the highest rate in New England. Everyone that needs it can receive SNAP or federal assistance. Another myth. So about 35% of folks that are food insecure are income ineligible for federal assistance programs. SNAP or food stamps provides enough benefits for everyone to eat healthy meals. It is a myth. So SNAP on average, the meal benefits about $1.19 per meal per person. So it usually runs out within the first two weeks of the month. And then lastly, type two diabetes and obesity are consequences of food insecurity. Yeah, that, that's a fact. So there have been a lot of, there's been a lot of research recently looking at the um, comorbidities that have to do with food insecurity and obesity and type 2 diabetes are two of them. So really briefly, briefly we're going to look at some case studies. And what I want you to do at your table groups is we're going to go through um, the case study. And I want you to tell me what challenges this person is facing in terms of accessing healthy food and what resources you think you could connect them with. So the first person is Mary Wilson. Mary is a student who works part-time and attends school full-time. She lives in an apartment and prepares her meals separately from her roommates. She has a small refrigerator and a microwave oven. She uses primarily to prepare her meals. Her budget to buy food is about $200 a month, depending on her other expenses. What factors may affect Mary's ability to eat healthy and what resources could you connect her with? I'll give you like one minute to discuss at your table. All right, are we ready to share out? No, I'll turn it off. So what are some challenges Mary might have for eating healthy in this situation? Absolutely, so she doesn't have a lot of storage. So she's gonna have to make frequent trips, which is gonna cost her time. So we talk about time scarcity and time poverty. So she's gonna to have to make more frequent trips to the grocery store. She's not gonna have a way to store that food. What else? I saw someone on the back. We talked about education and getting creative with perishables. So buying a rotisserie chicken that she can use for a week and use that as the protein in salads and um, maybe doing canned vegetables, even though it's not as healthy, but heating those up in the microwave and just kind of getting creative with the healthier aspects. Absolutely. Absolutely. Are there any other things that Mary might be facing in terms of trying to eat healthy? There's one really obvious one. Yeah, so she doesn't have like a stove or an oven to prepare healthy food. So if you're limited to what you can do in your microwave, that certainly limits your ability to cook healthy meals. What else is limiting her? Time, budget. So the most obvious thing is she only has $200 a month to spread out to eat healthy. And that's only if she doesn't have any other expenses. Okay. 
So we talked about the lack of storage and lack of equipment to cook healthy meals, and the price of food, time scarcity, some solutions we can connect her with, SNAP. So uh, college students are eligible for the SNAP program. So she is probably income eligible for that. Local food pantries, um, there is a common misconception that you can only get like canned goods at a local food pantry. And I will say that is a very common misconception. You can get fresh produce, you can get meats, you can get dairy. It's often set up like a grocery store. A nutrition education, so we talked about um, she has to get creative what, with what she can buy in terms of her budget and what she can store and what she can cook. So nutrition education around how to do that. Um, so classes like Snap Ed or Cooking Matters. Anyone have anything else? Okay. Our next case study is Mona Gray. She retired from her job about a year ago. So she receives a monthly pension of about $670 a month, plus her Social Security check of about $840. So her monthly income's a little over $1,500. After rent, electric, water, phone bills, and medical payments, she has about $50 a week, or about $7.14 per day to spend on groceries for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What factors may affect Mona's ability to eat healthy, and what could you connect her with to help stretch her dollars? All right, so let's try to share out what factors may affect Mona's ability to uh, eat a healthy diet. Uh, hi, my name is Hana, and I'm in the exercise science program. And one of the factors that affects Mona's ability to eat a healthy diet would be her lack of a budget for such a grocery list. Absolutely, so a limited budget. <laughs> what else in general do you think um, is particular for senior citizens or elderly um, Mainers in terms of their ability to eat healthy? Yeah, so things like transportation, so if they can drive or not, mobility, so most folks that might be struggling with like arthritis and stuff like that, so handing them a butternut squash to chop up might not be the best option. Uh, anything else particular to older, older members? Yeah, that's actually a really good point that I didn't even think about. So their ability to even eat a lot of healthy food, so um, you know, oral health and stuff like that is really important to consider when you're talking about food insecurity and the resources you can connect folks to. Yeah, so she might or might not be able to cook. We don't know that, but okay. So, what kind of resources do you think would be best to connect her with? Meals on Wheels, absolutely. Yep, so transportation programs. Yeah, absolutely, making sure she's connected to low-income housing so she has a little more wiggle room in her budget. Anyone in Biddle? <laughs> we'll just stare at them until they answer. Okay. All right, so we talked about a lot of the challenges already. So access to healthy food. Sorry, we do have a, a bit oh, of heard sorry. feedback here at this table. Good. Okay. Um, hi, my name is JC. Um, another restriction um, is that it mentions that she has medical payments, so she could have dietary restrictions. <laughs> <laughs> she could have a diary. Oh my God. She could have uh, food restrictions uh, based on her medical needs. So, 
Yeah, that's a really good point. Back she might Portland. have uh, like a medically tailored diet she needs to stick to or other dietary restrictions um, due to her age or due to uh, medical issues. So we also talked about her ability to cook and prepare food. Some programs we could connect her with include SNAP. So seniors are actually um, the most underutilized, like, I don't know how to say it. They underutilize the SNAP program more than any other population group. A lot of it that is because of pride, and a lot of it's because they just don't realize that they qualify for the program. So senior commodities. So that's uh, senior commodities is a program where low-income seniors that are income eligible can receive groceries every month of non-perishable goods, meals on meals as well for low-income seniors for um, folks that can't. Uh, prepare food by themselves. Uh, prescription assistance, so we talked about um, housing assistance or transportation, but also prescription assistance. Um, all right, we got one more. All right, Bill is a disabled veteran. He receives a military pension. Due to his disability, Bill cannot drive and lives in an area that is not easily accessible to larger grocery stores. After his monthly expenses, Bill is left with about $300 a month to purchase food for himself. He can only carry about two bags of food at a time. Therefore, he needs to buy food about twice a week. He can only spend nine or $10 a day for food in order for his money to last all month. What are some factors that may affect Bill's ability to eat healthy and what resources can you connect him to? Um, I think we, my name is Greg and I'm an ed major here. Um, I think we could provide maybe um, a Meals on Wheels to do outreach to him to help him with the, um, the travel issue. Absolutely, Meals on Wheels sounds like an ideal program for someone like Bill that is primarily homebound or does not have the capacity to pick up food at a large grocery store. What other things may affect his ability to eat healthy meals? Um, we talked a little bit at this table. I'm, my name is Amy. I'm a DO student. We talked a little bit at this table about how buying in bulk is often cheaper for people, but because he has a limited ability to carry, he might find it more difficult to buy in bulk and save money that way. Absolutely. We often hear the easiest way to save food, to save money on like food and toiletries and stuff like that is to buy in bulk. But that's working off the assumption that you have somewhere to store all of that food and you have a way to transport it from a Sam's Club or a Costco or a BJ's to your place of residence. So that's a really good point. Over here we had um, some concerns about like his ability to actually, his living situation. So we don't know if he's able to actually cook or prepare meals or what that looks like. So what are some services we can connect him with? Said Meals on Wheels, is there anything else that you can think of? Yeah, a case manager that can kind of help him navigate um, all the services he may need. RTP, so for transportation to and from the grocery store, absolutely, or to or from a doctor's office. So transportation services and vouchers as well as SNAP, the local food pantries. Um, a lot of food pantries do offer delivery for folks that can't get there. Um, Meals on Wheels, of course, but also like veteran services. So um, trying to figure out um, what he might be eligible for in terms of veteran services and if they can help um, reduce his bills at all. So. So that's all I have for a presentation, but I'm happy to take questions or um, direct you to um, resources so you can get involved. If you're interested in learning how you can support the Ending Hunger Network in terms of volunteer work, um, let me know. I can connect you to local resources within Greater Portland or Bitterford, as well as um, the Food Bank. And if you have any questions, please let me know.